the theology class that I'm doing now is actually uh, titled Experiencing and, and Encountering the Holy Spirit. And so um, I enjoy these, these studies of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to ask you a couple questions and give you some answers or a question with some answers uh, to begin to get you to think how I've already been thinking. But I think most of you are aware that we have the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And God the Father sent His Son, Jesus, who was conceived by His Spirit through the Virgin Mary. And then as Jesus was leaving and going to be crucified, death, burial, resurrection, back into heaven, He was telling His disciples, I'm not going to leave you without me, basically. I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to leave something with you. There's going to be a Spirit, part of myself, that's here to give you life and energy and power as you continue your journey through this life. My life will be left inside of you. And so we have the Father the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. And so tonight a question for you is, is the Holy Spirit at work in your life? How or what can you say is an evidence of Holy Spirit being at work in your life? Have you experienced the presence of God's Spirit around you. By different ways, maybe of sensing his presence as you're reading the scripture. Having a knowledge or an understanding that God created all of the universe and even yourself. In the time of a great need or crisis, you can just feel the nearness of his spirit. Fellowshipping in his spirit when you're with other believers. This we've just experienced, being in all of his spirit's presence in worship. Hearing the voice of his spirit while you're praying. Having a sudden insight of truth by reading the scripture, revelation of the word. Being led by the Spirit's supernatural peace when you're facing a decision. And so I forgot to mention earlier, I had an announcement, I forgot. But I did want to thank Brother Ricky and the worship team and for doing an incredible job. And for the media, Pastor Pete and the media team, Adam has very, been very faithful on the sound and, and the cameras and all those different things. We're very grateful for them you know, making all things possible that they do behind the scenes. Um, also, my announcement was that uh, the, the uh, business meeting is coming up uh, the last Sunday of February, February 28th. Uh, we're going to do our best to do that here live. Um, there's plenty of room to spread out. We need a quorum, I think, around just under 80 um, so we're going to proceed with that. The um, deacon nomination boxes are out, or at least one I know is out in the back school foyer. Uh, we do have four deacons coming off. Um, Jim Boozer, Steve Jenkins, Jason Merritt, and Jim Beerman will be coming off. And then um, Paul Barmoy is due for re-election. So the bylaws of the church are written as you serve two terms, two years. Sorry, you serve two years, and then you have to be re-elected. You can serve two more. And then it's a mandatory one year off. And we did that so that you don't spend 65 years on the church board. You have a little break and, you know, different life and breath and different things like that. So uh, that's why there's four who come off, one who is revoted, and then whoever um, you nominate is put into the box. And then we follow the Constitution and the bylaws and get down through all the checklists um, with a committee, um, not of deacons, but a committee that's... Uh, created uh, to, to go through the process. And I can assure you, your election here will be much more pleasant than what you've recently experienced. Okay? Because we have the Holy Spirit here. So we're going to be in the book of John a lot tonight. And so I use, or am using the Passion Translation. Uh, Pastor Pete, I believe, is going to throw the living, New Living Translation up there. But I just want to read some verses with you and get you to think and to show you some different things in, in Scripture that are just good stuff, good things about the Holy Spirit. In John 3, 5, John 3, verse 5. 
Oh, and this is Nicodemus. So, you know, Nicodemus was that uh, prominent Jewish leader that was just curious about this Messiah, this Jesus thing, and what's all going on, you know. And so he was asking questions and, and, and different things. And, and Jesus uh, was talking to, uh, or Nicodemus was talking to Jesus about a rebirth and how can a gray-haired man be, be reborn again. And Jesus answered him and he said, John 3, 5, I speak in eternal truth. Unless you are born of water and spirit, wind, you will never enter God's kingdom realm. And so we have here the the word, and I was talking to Brother Paul directly there earlier. The the Passion translations a lot of times will bring out, like, you know, there's Greek words for spirit, and this one is pneuma, which means wind. And so the, the Passion translation put Passion translation puts spirit hyphen wind, and you know that that's the word pneuma in in the Greek. And so he's saying that you are born of water and spirit wind. You will never enter. For God's kingdom realm, for the natural realm, can only give birth to things that are natural, but the spiritual realm gives birth to the supernatural. In John 4, verse 23... So here, Perry, just turn in. For from here on, worshiping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but with the right heart. For God is a spirit, and he longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and truth. And again, this is the word here that God is breath and God is wind. And Jesus refers here to the Spirit as the breath and the wind more than a hundred times in the gospel. And I want you to remember that I'm referring and bringing this out about Spirit and wind because of the word picture I'm going to give you at the end as we continue to press on here. And so there's a relationship between worship and and the Holy Spirit. Can you not agree with me tonight that when you worshiped, you sensed Holy Spirit? Right? So there's a relationship in my relationship with God. The way that I can build and work my relationship with God is by worshiping Him. Because when I worship Him, it's a relationship to His Spirit. Keep going in John chapter 7. And so this is Jesus who is at the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles serves as a reminder... When God led the Israelites by his presence into Sinai Desert. So how did God lead them? By his presence, right? God led them by his presence into the Sinai Desert as they lived in tents. And God led them there. The Lord provided for their every need. Okay, that is the... Uh, reason for the Feast of Tabernacles was to remember the time when God led the Israelites by his presence into the desert and that he provided for them every need. And so in verse 37, I'm going to start at 37, chapter 7, John 7, 37. It says, Then on the most important day of the feast, the Feast of the Tabernacles, which is the last day, Jesus stood and shouted out to all the crowds, All of you thirsty ones, Come to me. Come to me and drink. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scriptures say. So 
So it is a flowing out of the rivers of God from his throne. And so we as Christians allow the Holy Spirit flowing through us into other people's lives. Remember um, in Acts 4, 36, we have Barnabas. And Barnabas was the son of his nickname. It was a nickname. Barnabas was a nickname, son of encouragement. Who said that? You get a piece of candy. Good job. Son of encouragement. And so the Holy Spirit can use people to bring encouragement. I don't know about you, but after having maybe a horrible day or whatever circumstance you may be going through, when you come into his presence like we've just done and we worship, do you not find yourself encouraged? Do you not find yourself energized? Do you find yourself not having some wind in your sails? And so the Spirit of God flows through us and we can allow it to flow into other people's lives like Barnabas with encouragement. Keep going. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus is prophesying about the Holy Spirit. Loving me empowers you to obey my commands. So loving Jesus gives us the energy and the power to obey his commands. You know, one of my often prayers to the Lord is, Father, help me to prove my love to you by my obedience to you. By my obedience to you, your word, the leading of the Holy Spirit, may I prove my love to you by following after you, by obeying your commandments, by obeying your word. And he says, when you love me, it empowers you to obey my word. The voice of the Holy Spirit becomes a more common or a louder voice, if you will, in the busyness of everything around us. And isn't it true that as we worship the Lord, I mean, couldn't you just like stop right now and go back into worship again? Doesn't it like this, it's a magnet to your soul, to your body? Because God created us as humans to be filled with a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those who are not born again have such an emptiness, have such a void, have such an openness. I mean, you can see how people try to fill their lives with so many things, but it leads to emptiness when they're not a born-again Christian. And they just search and search and do and spend and live certain ways. And it's just like they keep hitting voidness, emptiness. So Jesus says, loving me empowers you to obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he's going to give you another Savior. And I love that word, another, because it means Another one of the same kind. My father's going to give you another as the same kind as me is what Jesus is saying because Jesus is going to go into heaven as he's death, burial, and resurrection. Give you another savior, the Holy Spirit of truth who will be to you a friend just like me. He will never leave you. Now, the world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you know him intimately. And why is that? Because he remains with you and he will live inside of you. And so the word here talks about the word parakletos. And that is a word that is translated, one who is called to come and stand next side to you. As a helper. And so we have this relationship with Christ that it's like an all inclusive. It's He's going to give you something to come alongside of you on your behalf, stand next to you, and help you. 
or to counsel you. He's going to comfort you. He will be your advocate, your encourager, your intercessor or helper. And so the word Savior here is translated and depicts the Holy Spirit as a protector and defender and one who saves us from ourself and our enemies and keeps us whole and healed. You know, as, as one comes to Christ, and we'll read this, I'm getting ahead of myself. We have to yield to the Lord and recognize him, right? So, so to become a born-again Christian, you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that what? Jesus Christ is ruler, Lord, boss, okay? And so it is of the Holy Spirit, the one who convicts and convinces me to come to him and to surrender. The surrendering part can be the challenging part. We can confess with our mouth all day long. We can say anything. But it's that believing in the heart, the confessing, the surrendering, the letting go of self and allowing him to be the source of faith and provider, counselor, leaning on him, constantly leaning on him in place of our own self. Keeps us from our enemies and keeps us whole and healed. He is the one who guides and defends, comforts and consoles us. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ our Savior. Now that word parakaleto comes out of two root words, and I love this because it is the root word to finish or bring to an end, and the other word is the curse, to bring an end to the curse. And what a beautiful word picture as the Holy Spirit comes to end the work of the curse of sin in our lives. The Holy Spirit comes to bring an end to the curse of sin in our lives. So if you go back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they could not eat of the tree. He blocked the Garden of Eden so they could not go back in to eat of the tree of life, right? But then in Revelations, the tree of life is in heaven for us to take of constantly. It's in the middle of the, of the river and the roads. It says it's right in the middle. And we partake of the tree of life. And when God would come and walk in the cool of the night, after Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They hid. From what? From the presence of God. But for us, because of his son, Jesus Christ, and now the Holy Spirit, he brought an end to that curse of sin where we are made righteous and his life comes inside of our void souls and fills us with his very own life, his spirit. And so when you die, when I die, and we go to heaven, you don't have to worry about anything because your, your stamp, your past, it's already inserted inside of you. The Spirit. It says it's the Holy Spirit who marks you present in the kingdom of God. It's the commonness of His Spirit and your Spirit, His Spirit's in you. And so when you go to heaven, it's, you already got your ticket. You're in because we're of a common spirit. But I love that that root word of paracleta is to bring an end or finish the curse. And what a beautiful word that paracleta is a redeemer who ends the curse. So he sends alongside a helper, a counselor, a guide, a teacher, a and with that, parakaleto and parakaleta, the two words broken apart, he is my redeemer 
who ends the curse of sin. In Psalms 119, you don't really have to turn there. You can, you can read there throughout your Bible study and through your reading. It's constantly um, referencing the, the power of the word. Um, so, for example, Psalms 119, 13 says, I speak continually of your, your word as I recite it out loud. It is your counsel to me. When we put inside of us the things of God the word, how much more easy, how much more common would it be for him to bring those things to our remembrance if I'm putting his word into my mind more than the latest country song maybe, I don't know, than something other than other things, the news, how about that, the media. What's going to come to your mind more often, the word or the media? What more are you putting in And the Holy Spirit comes along and prompts, reminds you, counsels you from the word that you put into your mind. Or is he going to, where he's able to strengthen you through his own word. I speak continually of your law and your word as I recite out loud your counsels to me. You can just go, I mean, you can just pick almost any verse as you jump through Psalms 119. And it talks constantly about uh, the word of the Lord and And how it's powerful in our lives to keep that in the forefront of our minds. Psalms 15, 26. He says, I will send you the divine encourager from the very presence of my Father. I will send you the divine encourager from the very presence of my Father. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, verse 3. This is the chapter that talks about spiritual gifts. So therefore, I want to, verse, uh, First Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore, I want to impart to you an understanding of the following. No one speaking by the Spirit of God would ever say that Jesus is the accursed one. Anytime that you have someone says they're speaking, God's word or in his behalf and not referencing him to the great I am, the son of God, you know that it's not. But the next section I want to, so it will be like verse 3b, the second part. No one can say Jesus is Lord, Yahweh, unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. No one can say Jesus is Lord, Yahweh, unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us strength and boldness to confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, as Master, as the, as the boss, as I was mentioned earlier. I told you I was getting ahead of myself. So it is the Holy Spirit that gives us that strength and that boldness to confess Jesus Christ as our Savior. So if you have, or how, if you think about how to pray for unsaved loved ones or one who is not saved, it is the Holy Spirit that we can pray that they would yield to the convicting or the convincing. Convicting is kind of a strong word, you know. People like to say, I'm convicted. Convincing of them, of their hearts, that Jesus Christ is Lord, is Yahweh. Go 
Go back with me to John, John 16. We're walking through the book of John, John 16, 5. Jesus is warning his disciples, says, But now I am about to leave you and go back to join the one who sent me. You need to be told, yet not one of you are asking me where I am going. Instead, your hearts are filled with sadness because I told you these things. But there's the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away, because if I don't go away, the divine encourager will not be released to you. But after I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will expose sin and prove that the world is wrong about God's righteousness and his judgments. It is the spirit and the truth that guide into truth. God wills it, Jesus speaks it, and it's the Holy Spirit that gives the strength and the power to walk it out. And the Holy Spirit is work, at work all around us. But, you know, it's, it's our sensitivity to him that we're able to miss him, if you will. And so if you think about it, we'll use husband and wife, okay? So my wife can be in the room with me. And I know that she's there, but I'm not sensitive to the fact that she's there. Right? Guys? Nobody else? So she can have said something to you, and you said, uh-huh. But yet you were not really truly sensitive to the fact of that she was really there and what she said. And so you can use that kind of as an image or a thought. The Holy Spirit is constantly at work. I mean, it's inside of you, right? It's all around you. And so the Holy Spirit is constantly at work, but one of the things that keeps us from recognizing it is our sensitivity to him and so it's our awareness to him so you know the word presence we stand in the presence of the Lord is actually means to turn and face face to face when you're in his presence it actually that word presence means face to face before the face of in his presence. And so I love in Revelations, it's Revelations, hmm, I looked this up earlier. It's Revelations 1. You're going to see this. Turn back to Revelations 1. Quick. Revelations chapter 1. So John, the apostle's writing this book. John wrote Revelations, right? It's in the very first chapter of Revelations. This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to share with his loving servants. And as John, in verse 9, and on over it says that, uh, John says, I was exiled on the island of Patmos. Why was I exiled there? Well, because of the ministry of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit realm on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice. That loud voice sounded like a trumpet, saying to me, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, etc., etc., etc. And then go to verse 12. When I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. So it says, on the Lord's day, I heard behind me, a loud voice, sounding like a trumpet, and then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. The presence of the Lord, you face, you come face to face. And it is in that relationship and in his presence that we're actually experiencing the Holy Spirit. And so in the beginning, how we said, ask some questions, is the Holy Spirit working in your life? You can say yes, because when I get into the presence of the Lord, I mean, what is the imagination? What do you imagine when you're worshiping the Lord? What is the image that you have in your forefront of your mind? Anybody? 
when I stand before the Lord and I worship him and I close my eyes, I, I just imagine in my mind God sitting on the throne, Jesus there. And, and I find myself in a posture a lot of times like this, bowing humbly before God Almighty, but I've always, it's always like I'm, I'm, try, I'm facing him, I'm in his presence, because in that presence is where I experience Holy Spirit. And when I'm experiencing, I'm having a relationship with him, and I'm surrendering myself to the work of the Holy Spirit. He just does those supernatural things that aligns me and keeps me walking in a path of righteousness. For I am holy and we are to be holy, right? And so it just helps align all the stuff inside of me. In this class, it talks about Jesus was born, created, birthed by the Holy Spirit, right? So inside of him is 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 it's raka so it's it's god breathed life spirit and so jesus was born with inside of him god spirit we were born a sinner right and so as we're born a sinner we have the pneuma inside of us we have the void inside of us so is Jesus having already the spirit inside of him? It's like sin tried to come from the outside in and knock him off kelter, if you will, right? Us, born of a sinful nature, of the pneuma, the suka inside of us, are constantly fighting and warring against the sinful nature. His spirit inside of us, Sin inside of us for me to try to live a holy and righteous life on the inside out. Does that make sense? But it is the Holy Spirit that comes and gives the new birth, the new spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of me to make me new and make me fresh, a new life. But then as I go in my journey and my walk with the Lord, how focused Am I staying, how sensitive am I staying to the Holy Spirit inside of me? So in Ephesians, if you look at Ephesians, it's Ephesians, whoops, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 18. We talked earlier about the spirit wind, right? So here's the whole reason I told you everything tonight is to tell you this. Ephesians 5, 18. Living in God's wisdom. Okay, here we go. Let me see. 17. Don't live foolishly. Ephesians 5, 17. Don't live foolishly because then you will have discernment to fully understand God's will and don't get drunk with wine which is rebellion you know it, that reminds me not about drunkenness um, you are successful in your life when you do the small things every day and what do I mean by small things when you do the small things like your daily devotion with God your prayer, your reading of the Bible plan, your reading, your worshiping, your working towards righteousness, your constant battling with trying to be that good person. All those little small things, doing those consistently every day, every day is success. And you are successful when you do those little small things every day. Because those little small things have massive effects. Does that make sense? Those little small things that you do every single day have massive, massive effects. I was listening to a podcast yesterday. I think he's the CEO of the Lakers basketball team, and it was Kerry Newhoff. They're both 
legal attorneys or something, but neither one practiced as attorneys, and they were talking. And, and, and these guys who are super brilliant leaders, just in, incredible, incredible to take these guys' championships and, and the way they work the team together and everything. These guys, these leaders talk about their everyday, daily, daily schedule of how they meet with the Lord and how important it is for them. In fact, Denzel Washington, they were working with him on something, a movie or something, and Denzel Washington said that he put his tennis shoes, he was staying in a hotel, doing the movie set, he put his tennis shoes underneath the center of his bed because it forced him every morning to get on his knees. Whatever you have to do to do those little things, Stick your tennis shoes in the middle of your bed so you've got to get on your knees to dig them out. And while you're down there, say a little prayer. It's those little things that have such massive effects in our lives. Ephesians 5, 17. Don't live foolishly for then you will have discernment to fully understand God's will. And when you do those little things, you know, people get so caught up in what's God's will for my life, what's God's will for my life. Well, God's will for your life, for every single one of you is to be working towards maturity in your spiritual life with Christ. I mean, these guys are attorneys who are now basketball coaches. or what? what listen, what's, they were talking about, what's God's will? I don't know what the long-term God's will. I mean, the long-term God's will is to be in heaven with God. But the journey on the way is all kinds of other different little things. God's will is fulfilled every day in my life. And then when I get to the end of the journey, I fulfilled God's will. Because I've allowed myself to follow after the leading of the Holy Spirit every day. I can't just follow after the Holy Spirit one day and say, I'm going to be a pilot today. That's God's will for my life. Now I'm going to be a preacher. That's God's will for my life. No, it's the little things every day that direct you into the big things, the big effects that your life has on others. So instead, don't get drunk with wine which is rebellion. Instead, be filled with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And your hearts will overflow with a joyful song to the Lord Jehovah. Keep speaking to each other with words and scripture, singing the Psalms and with praises and spontaneous songs given by the Spirit. Always give thanks to the Father God for every person he brings into your life. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive to one another. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to give us power. I just talked to you about a journey. So this is the word picture I want you to leave here with tonight. If you're on a journey, we're pilgrims passing through the land, right? Pilgrims came on a boat. So let's think of your journey as being in a rowboat. Your life is in a boat. And in your boat, you have rows, but you also have a sail. And you can raise that sail to catch the wind, to catch the spirit. But you have the choice whether you will raise the sail to catch the spirit or is your sail lowered and you're rowing yourself to death? Because the wind is the spirit. As you raise the sail, the wind catches you and it empowers you to go through your journey of life. So what are some examples of raising the sail? How do I raise the sail to catch the wind of the Spirit. Well, it's those little things. It's studying the Bible. It's praying. It's giving. It's being a witness. It's worshiping. It's serving. It's meditating. It's those things that help my sensitivity to stay keen of the Holy Spirit. It's all those little things that I do that's just simply raising the sail because the wind's always blowing maybe one knot, one mile an hour. I mean, there's always a little breeze going, right? And all you have to do is raise your sail, 
through prayer, Bible reading, ministry, volunteering at your church. All those little things raise your sail, worshiping in the presence of God, turning, presence facing God. I'm a redeemed child. The sin, the curse is broken, and I can face the Lord because of the blood of Jesus Christ and give worship and exaltation to him. And it puts his wind, it puts his power in my sail. What keeps you from raising your sail? What keeps the birthing process from happening inside of you? When you come into his presence and you're in need of a healing, and maybe physical, maybe more mental, maybe emotional, maybe you just have anger or, or something inside of you that you're constantly trying to keep a cap on. What is it that keeps that birthing process from happening? Is it distractions in your life? What keeps you from rowing and stopping and pausing to lift the sail? Is it a fear of losing control to the Spirit? Refusing to be disciplined? Maybe it's lack of experience of God in your life. No real hunger or thirst for, for God or the things of God. Maybe it's something like a misunderstanding really of who the Spirit is. How about having the mindset of not being presence driven but being policy driven? Think about that. Having the mindset of not being presence, Holy Spirit driven, but I'm always just following the book, not the Bible, the policy. This is just the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it has to be. You're always just following the policy. You follow on the policy. You're not allowing the Holy Spirit to say, oh, come on, over here. All I want you to do is go over to this person and say, you have a nice shirt on today. It's all the Holy Spirit's asking you to do. Oh, no, got to get my kids from nursery. Got to get them. Don't go say he has a nice shirt on. Right? Just little things like that. Little things like that. How about busyness? Guilty. That's mine. Busyness. I actually have a thing now on my phone, and I get a beep, and my phone goes off at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock to pause. Two minute pauses, five minute pauses, seven minute pauses, 10 minute pauses. That's my life. I don't know what you do. I don't know what your journey, your sailboat looks like. But it goes off on my phone, it dings, makes a special noise, and I have to pause. And I hit my little button and it walks me through encouraging scriptures of God that puts wind in my sail twice a day. So is the wind that you need in your sail something like no weapon formed against me shall prosper? Is that what you need to hear? Is that what you need to know? Is what constantly goes through your mind is I'm, I'm always sick. Oh, great. Here comes another cold. I'm getting another virus. Is that what's going through your mind or you need to say no? What is in my sail is God is my healer. He is my strength. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. What's in the wind of your sail? What are you grabbing hold of? Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like a shifting shadow. The law of the Lord is perfect and constantly refreshes my soul. The Lord is the sun and the shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from me. Is that what you need in your sail? Is that what you need to pause throughout the day, throw your sail up for your rowboat and get a little rest? When you pass through the waters, God says, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Those who have hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope, a future, success and prosperity. A richness of the Spirit of God in your life. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. 
So whatever builds a wall between you and the Spirit, whatever prevents you from raising your sail, it can be removed from your life simply by repenting and giving attention to your relationship with God. God the Father sits on the throne ruling all of creation. And on his right hand is Jesus Christ making continual intercession for us to comfort us, console us, reveal all truth to us. As Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to us, the very Spirit of God has come alongside of us to encourage us, to lead us, and we can raise our sail to catch the wind, the pneuma of the Holy Spirit to empower us. And so when you pray, you can ask of the Holy Spirit exactly these things. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid to ask of the Holy Spirit these things. But let me pray for you tonight a beautiful prayer that I think is wonderful to the Holy Spirit to pause and to invite him in and to help you. Instead of rowing, raise your sail. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you and, and Lord, we pause right now and because we know that the Holy Spirit is our teacher, Father, we say and ask, Holy Spirit, how is this teaching applicable to me? Lord, what is it that creates distractions? What is it that keeps me being sensitive to you, Holy Spirit? Why am I not raising the sail and catching the wind, the breath of God in my life and allowing it to empower me? So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring to our mind that word. I already said my word out loud. It's busyness. And so Father, Lord Jesus, I repent of the hindrance of busyness that has been keeping me from drawing close to your spirit. Forgive me, Holy Spirit. Forgive me for allowing busyness to bring so much distraction and noise into my life to where I don't raise my sail like I should. Holy Spirit, I welcome you into every aspect of my life. Holy Spirit, I invite you into every moment of my life. Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, come and fill my mind. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill my thoughts. Fill my mind with life and fill my life with peace. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being as real as you are. We thank you, Father God, that you have a plan for us. And Lord, we may raise the sail, but then it ends up dropping. It drops because we feel like the plan that we had or the plan that you had for us, we missed it. But Father, you have a plan and then you have plan number two. And Father, when we raise the sail and we catch some wind but it drops again, we get discouraged. We get overwhelmed. But guess what? Thank you, Lord. You have plan number three and four and five. 6,792 and plan after plan after plan because you've redeemed us from sin. So Father, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being inside of us, for being around us, for being constantly at work within us. Thank you. Thank you. Help me to be more sensitive to your spirit at work in my life. May your voice be the common voice, the, the louder voice in my heart, in my mind, in my emotions, in my spirit. And Father, may I prove my love to you by my obedience to your word. It's not a law-driven, it's a grace 
love abounding plan after plan after plan. Do it again. Come back to me again. I'm still here. I still love you. I still have wind for your sail. Oh, may, you may feel that your sail is tattered and torn and you don't even have one to raise. You don't have the energy to raise it. God is with you. God is strengthening you. He's bringing you through your journey of life into his will for your life, constantly growing into maturity with him. Father, we give you thanks because you're a great, great God. You are a great, great God. And we continue to press into you. We love you and we worship you and we honor you and we do exalt you. Father, the presence and the worship that we did here tonight collectively, we anticipate that again on Sunday. But Father, we still have Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But that's right, Lord. We can fall on our knees. We can turn on a CD. We can whistle, hem a song. Hum a song, however it is, and enter right into your presence and to face you and to exalt you. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. Bless these people here tonight, Lord. Bless those who watch us on the live stream, Father, on the internet, God. Bless them and keep them. Father, we thank you for their faithfulness to you. We thank you for their faithfulness to this church as volunteers, as givers, as showing up to this building. Because without them, Father, there would be no church. Bless them and keep them. May your face and your favor and your prosperity and your plan be upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.